Bible speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Hmm. From the moment we're saved, we are called to begin the process of laying aside those destructive tendencies of the natural man, that malice, that dishonesty, that double standard, greed, gossip, dissent, conflict. And setting that aside doesn't come easily or naturally to the natural man. And as Peter tells us, in order to grow, in order to mature enough to really let that stuff go, we have to desire, and I love how he puts it, the pure milk of the word. Like newborn babies or born again, we have to start with the basics, the milk, the fundamentals. And then throughout our lives, we have to be taught how to walk like Jesus. We have to be fed that milk until we become more and more self-sufficient so that we can feed ourselves and start feeding others the milk. It's kind of a parenting process, appropriate on Father's Day. <laughs> Just occurred to me. <laughs> So today I'm going to talk about the first two stages of that spiritual maturity process, which, as I discussed last week, the apostles refer to as spiritual infancy, babes in Christ, and then childhood or adolescence, if you will. Then next week we'll cover, I guess, the teen years and uh, <laughs> then on into young adult and full spiritual maturity. Now keep in mind, in practical reality in our lives, spiritual maturity is not really a cut and dry process, nor is it usually linear from one to the next to the next to the next. In fact, for me and I think for many of us, the process of spiritual maturity is often cyclical. <laughs> There's times of a little bit of backsliding. There's areas of our life where maybe we're a little bit stronger and then other times when we're a little bit weaker. It's, it's a process and it's not a pretty one sometimes. There's times when we are farther along in our maturity in some areas than our fellow brothers and sisters and other times when we really need to look up to them. But the progression of the human lifespan does provide us a good kind of model understanding and a way by which a believer can assess their own walk, their own maturity. It's also important, by the way, for us as Christians to be able to assess the spiritual maturity of other believers. Caution. Not so we can judge them. <laughs> Not so that we can point at them and say, ha ha. <laughs> but so that we can discern where they're at. So that we can know what to realistically expect from them. So we're not expecting too much, too little. And so that we can know how to set an example for them if we're farther along in some areas. Or know to follow their example when they're farther along than we are. Philippians 1, verses 9 and 10, gives us a little admonition here. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. So through our love for one another, we abound more and more in knowledge, 
and discernment. Discernment's a little different from judgment. And as we mature, as we gain knowledge and discernment, we still have to be without offense. You see, discerning someone else's level of spiritual maturity is an opportunity for us to have compassion for them, solidarity with them. It's also an opportunity for us to help, not judge, not gossip about, and not to punish them for where they are on their path. Frankly, no believer is in a position to cast the first stone, if you catch my drift. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 gives us an alternative. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. Now, the word edify in this passage is from the Greek oikotomeo, which means to build, the act of building, as in building a house. It's commonly used in construction in Greek. We, therefore, are to build one another up, like a house, not tear one another down. By correctly discerning our own level of maturity and correctly identifying the level of maturity of the people we're interacting with, we can become much more efficient builders because we know what's needed and we know what to expect. So that's enough preface. Now it's time to get into it. <laughs> Let's look at what it means to be a spiritual infant in Christ, a babe in Christ. In our reading, Peter tells us in verse 2 that as newborn babies in Christ, immature believers, immature Christians need to desire the pure milk of the word so that we can grow. Now, to understand this principle, think of the last time that you had experience with a little baby. Babies need almost constant care. Their role is to consume. I remember 2 a.m. feedings, so I'm telling you, their job is to consume. And they're not just consuming the milk. They're consuming everything. They're sponges. They're learning from every touch, every experience, everything going on in their little baby world. They're consuming it all. Why? So they can grow. It's not a bad thing that they need to be nurtured and fed, that they're consuming at this stage in their development. That's not bad at all. It's simply because they're not ready to do things for themselves yet or do things for other people yet. 1 Corinthians 3.1, this is one that I shared last week. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it. And even now you are still not able. <clears throat> There's a reason the apostles and biblical authors use the infant analogy for believers who are less mature than others. You can't give a baby meat. You can't expect a baby to read and write. You can't expect a baby to understand everything. They're babies. They have to grow and mature. Those who are still relatively spiritually immature in their walk as Christians are the same way. It's not a judgment of their character. It's simply where they are in their development. So we don't judge that. We don't judge little babies. This is merely an observation of where they are, and it's an opportunity for Christians who are a little further along to help them grow, to feed the baby to feed their needs so that they can mature, which is the point. That's what disciple-making is. So keeping in mind that when it comes to spiritually, spiritual maturity, we're not talking about time-based maturity. A new Christian can be and usually is an immature Christian, but you know what? A lifelong believer can be too. Too. 
Infants in Christ, as described in Scripture, just like babies, are consumers. They need a lot done for them. They're most fed by things like church services, where they're given the Word, being taught in Bible studies, in home group Bible studies, or by their mentors in the church, where it's being taught and given to them just like we feed a baby. There's nothing wrong with that. It's a beautiful thing. Since we're talking about physical adults who are physically mature but spiritually new and immature, there is an aspect that's a little different from a little bitty baby, and that is that spiritually immature Christians oftentimes have trouble letting go of old thoughts and beliefs and patterns from their life before they were saved. That can get in the way of some of their spiritual growth. And just like newborn babies, they lack knowledge. More specifically, they can be very intelligent, but they lack knowledge of God's word. As a new Christian, as a spiritually immature Christian, one of the hallmarks is that they don't know God's word very well yet. It's not a judgment, just a fact. And Hebrews 5.13 tells us, for everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe, confirming that that's where they're lacking. That's what they need. That's the milk they need. Matthew 4.4, 4, but he answered and said, it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. <clears throat> Christian author and theologian Jim Putman and his colleagues have written several good books on discipleship, and I've read a number of them. I read one a short time ago called Discipleship. Clever name, right? <laughs> which outlines some of the characteristic statements that you will hear Christians utter at different stages of their spiritual maturity. Now, Mr. Putman's book is not scripture. However, I do feel that the examples he gave in the book are very much in keeping with the spiritual principles that we're learning from scripture today. So I'm going to share a few of them with you because I find them practical when assessing my own and others' spiritual maturity. Those who are still in that consumer phase in their spiritual maturity might say things like these. Well, why is it important for me to be at church every Sunday? Oh, I didn't know the Bible said that. I'm not much of a prayer, really, but I commune with God when I walk in the woods. How come my wife and I still fight? Wasn't Jesus supposed to fix all the problems in our life? So brothers and sisters, when we hear those kinds of statements, those other indications of spiritual infancy, we needn't judge that person. This is an important and exciting time in the believer's life. These immature attitudes and behaviors don't reflect a problem with their character. They've been saved for crying out loud. <laughs> They indicate an opportunity for learning, for growth, for teaching. You don't get angry at a baby when they don't know how to program your DVD player, do you? <laughs> no, they don't know how yet. So why would we get angry with a believer? They just haven't learned yet. What a beautiful opportunity for us to teach them, to mentor them to watch the wonder in their eyes as the mysteries of God unfold themselves for them. They get into the Word. They start seeing what it really is all about. That's exciting. Now, despite the negative connotations of the term immature, this stage of spiritual development is also one of the best because the immature believers are generally really hungry for God. Sometimes those who are farther along in their path kind of lose some of that enthusiasm. Not okay. It's a great chance for us to draw from that energy, that hunger. I want to know more. I got to consume. I want to consume. We could all use a little bit more of that. That's why it's so important that there be mature believers there to feed them. <clears throat> 
Colossians 2 2. <clears throat> that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ. Mm. Yeah, that's why we feed. So we can watch that happen in the believer's life so that their hearts may be encouraged and we can watch them grow. Anyone who's raised children knows what I'm talking about. Now those who see these spiritually immature characteristics in themselves and are honest about it, to those, the way forward is pretty clear from what we've read so far. They must get into the Word. They must be taught the Word. They must be taught by their pastor in their sermons. They must be taught in their Bible studies. They must be taught by example by their mentors in the church, by those who are a little farther along. And they mustn't just read the Word, but they've got to start learning how to do the Word in order to move to that next stage of maturity as a Christian. Now, for those who are further along and start recognizing these signs in other believers, well, they are called to be patient, to give of their time. And in fact, in that spiritual infancy, just like with little bitty babies, this is when they need the most time from believers who are more mature. We have to be patient, kind, and testify of the truth of God's ways, of God's word, and our own personal experiences with how to create new habits now that we are born again in Christ so that the person can grow into the next phase of spiritual maturity, childhood or adolescence. Now, those of you who have raised children know that the adolescent years can be tough ones. <laughs> children can do some things for themselves, but they're still largely dependent on their parents. They can also be stubborn, overconfident, convinced of the black and white of complex issues, and sometimes even prideful. I have a seven-year-old at home <laughs> and an 11-year-old, and, and they're wonderful people, but kids can do these things. And of course, on the flip side, they can also be really insecure, timid, or really easily discouraged. Characteristics to watch for. Paul recognized the signs of spiritual adolescence, if you will, in many of the early churches. He wrote about it in a lot of his letters. He recognized why, at this stage of the game, it was so important to be both firm and loving with the spiritually young, if you will. He was a great father to the early church. Happy Father's Day, Paul. You see, just like children, those believers in the early churches needed to be nurtured, but they also needed a firm, loving guidance and correction in those areas where they still needed to overcome that old human nature, just like parenting. And just like a parent disciplining a child, mature Christians need to do that for people who are spiritually immature, need to do it gently and with love, because just like for our own children, we want what's best for them. When we're motivated by that, that's spiritual maturity. 1 Thessalonians 2. Let's read verses 10 through 12. This is another example. This is a great example of Paul being a father to the early church. You are witnesses, and God also, how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe, as you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you. 
as a father does his own children, that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. The adolescent believer, spiritually speaking, is characteristically self-focused. Again, this isn't a judgment of their character. It's the characteristic of the level of maturity. They're focused on themselves. It's all about me. What can the church do for me? You can recognize these early stage believers by statements like, I just don't think this church is feeding my needs anymore. I think I might shop around for a few other churches. Or, and by the way, that one is, uh, it shows that they're still counting on the church to feed their needs. Just like kids, they can do some things for themselves. My kids can make great PBJ sandwiches, but if they need vegetables or anything like that, I gotta get involved. <laughs> so spiritual immaturity has to do with still counting on the church to feed that spiritual need instead of being able to feed ourselves. Or statements like, ah, no one visits me from this church. No one ever calls me. I don't think anybody even likes me at this church. Or flip side, this church really needs me. I don't know what they would do without me. I don't know who would stay on top of things if it weren't for me. Or this one, I've heard this one before. I'd really like to get involved in the youth ministry, but nobody's ever asked me. As frustrating as these statements can be to all of us, this is when the believer needs mature guidance and mentorship the most. Mentorship from believers who are even just slightly ahead of where they are. Because frankly, we are all, every single one of us, called to make disciples. So no matter where we are personally in our spiritual maturity, we've got to be setting an example for the people who are less mature than we are in any area. The Christian who recognizes in their own walk that they're in the spiritual kind of childhood phase of their spiritual maturity should immediately reach out to a friend and mentor in the church, someone they know is further along by humbling themselves and allowing themselves to be taken under someone's wing. Well, then they're both fed and they're both taught and they're both built up. And if the more mature believer recognizes signs of spiritual adolescence in another believer, then it's time to invest in them. Invest in them with our time. Invest in them with our genuine friendship. Because the principles of the gospel, the principles of a Christian life don't just happen here in this building on Sundays from 11 to 12. <laughs> They're part of our daily life. So we need to make each other part of our daily lives in order to really mentor. By making the newer Christian, the younger Christian, if you will, a part of your life, you model for them how to live Christian principles. And yes, the more mature believer needs to be patient. That one can be tough sometimes. Needs to be gentle. And needs to have realistic expectations that are appropriate to the spiritual maturity of the person they're dealing with. Again, not judging their character, but knowing, hey, when they're in this phase, this is how they're likely to do things so that the more mature believer can bring the immature along, help them grow, so that the spiritual child may, as it says in Ephesians 4.15, <clears throat> but speaking the truth in love, may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. May grow up into all the things related to Jesus. And that's the whole point. It's the whole point of church. Every believer, every individual believer needs to focus on whatever it takes to begin conforming their life more and more to the example set for us by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. <clears throat> 
Now, next week, we'll continue looking at these phases. We'll go through those teen years on into that spiritual adulthood and maturity. But before we finish up today, I want to circle back to our reading one last time and to a point that was made at the end of the reading that kind of ties this all together. I love how God does that through Peter. <clears throat> our reading in verse 5 said, you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now that brothers and sisters, is the work of oikotomeo, edification, building up. The building up of us Christians into those whose very lives are acceptable sacrifices to the Lord. Now God is doing that work within us by the power of the Holy Spirit. Our role is to follow the Spirit's lead to relinquish ourselves, and that involves humility. To let our hearts, our souls, our minds, and our bodies be conformed to the image of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because Philippians 1.6, <clears throat> being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> Invite the worship team back up. Let's raise our voices in song. I have decided to follow thee, Jesus. Jesus.